We're kicking off Brand Voice Runway with a series of interviews, what I call mini interviews. We'll be releasing the full length discussions later this month, but to give you a sense of the show, we wanted to start with something a little bit shorter because this is a sit down show, they're conversations. We go in depth, we dig deep. I'm not bringing these heavy hitters in here to answer six questions and get them out of here in eight minutes. So I really hope you enjoy both the mini and the full length episodes. And thanks again for tuning in. But I think that if people want to really monetize the relationship of selling the truth, then they need to figure out a way to be truthful with their audience. I think there is a role for basically saying, listen, you know, we're doing this, you know, using AI and, you know, you're the brand expert, but there's a way to build brand trust in saying, oh, this brand is being more honest with me than others. And that can be a differentiator. All branding is personal. And it's not about who you say you are. It's about who you are and how you say it. I'm Hirsch Repu, copywriter, comedian, and brand voice expert. I've helped hundreds of companies fine tune their messaging. And now I'm sitting down with some of the most ambitious and imaginative founders around who share their seven figure and eight figure stories and next figure goals. Let's hit the brand voice runway. With me on the Brand Voice Runway today is George King. George is an experienced executive and advisor in organizational strategy and a professor in the University of New Haven College of Business. Mr. King is vice chairman and chief investment officer of Fiducia Investors and vice chair of IP FAMBA, F-A-M-B-A, a sports tech company. I could go on and on. And I could go into his education. I could go into his many, many accomplishments. I encourage you to read the show notes and get a, a full picture if you're not already familiar with George. Welcome, George, to the Brand Voice Runway. Thank you, Hirsch. And I think that's what LinkedIn is for, is to <laughs> provide all those details for all of us. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's supposed to save time. Well, let's look at Let's start with this. With a lot of the deals and the wealth management and financial advising and other things that you've done, when you look at your personal brand, because you have companies and chairmanships and roles and boards and all kinds of stuff, but when you look at the whole picture of George King, what do you see? So the common denominator, Hirsch, is that uh, both by intent and by circumstance, both, I have developed what I like to refer to as a multidimensional mindset backed up by multidimensional experience. And the way I summarize that, what I see is an approach that I refer to as taking a 360 degree approach to situations. So you see every angle in a way. Right. I don't overstate that I can see every element of every angle. But I do consciously go about analyzing a situation from a as close to a 360 degree perspective as I can. And by that, to make it more concrete, leveraging the, for example, the part of my expertise that relates to legal and then the financial markets and then corporate governance and technology and organizational evolution over time. So I try to look at situations that way. And I find that tends to give me a different kind of value add than my clients and my friends are able to find elsewhere. Yeah, that does make sense. Is there a favorite area of yours? I would say that the theme of finance and financial markets really was my favorite area for the first 15 years of my career. I was working at a Wall Street law firm and then at a major Wall Street law firm and then a major Wall Street investment bank, and then a spin out from that investment bank and then had my own financial advisory firm. So it was really capital markets as the catalyst for getting things done 
building projects, building companies, building value, et cetera. And then around the time of the telecom deregulation, I was fortunate enough through networking, referrals, et cetera, to be invited to be part of a one of the early fiber optic telecom companies. And that really triggered my second passion in business, which is the whole area of technology. So I would say both finance and technology are two threads that have been consistent for many, many years. And the ability to combine those whenever that comes up, that is particularly exciting. So finance and technology or technology and finance, whichever way you want to look at it. Well, to think of it that way, one does what doesn't really thrive without the other. Right. You know, technology, research, our survival, you know, both are existential, whether we want to admit it or not. You know, we're exploring so many different areas of research, but without funding, that research doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. It's not the way the world works. Right. And even though I started out on the financial, you know, the deep dive in the financial side, and then added technology later, I've come to realize over time that the evolutions and innovations in the technology space are really core to how value is preserved, grown, created, disrupted, all of the above, right? So I'd say, you know, if we look back really at any period of time, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, however far you want to go back, I think the the evolution of different technologies is really at the core of how financial returns and wealth creation, wealth preservation, all of that has evolved. And I think that's happening, you know, we see that happening even, you know, on real time basis, you know, today in 2023. Yeah. And now you mentioned to me, George, in our correspondence that you share my emphasis on selling the truth. I use that phrase a lot. That's the title of my upcoming book is selling the truth. How do you come to view that phrase selling the truth? Right. So I think Hirsch, you would have done very well starting out in the financial area because in both the legal side and the investment banking side, and investment banking really is raising capital, right? It's a selling, raising capital from people. There's a legal requirement to sell the truth. And in the financial markets that goes, you know, in the United States, we have the, you know, the rule about full disclosure of what's important. The word is material, but, you know, full disclosure of what's important and not to omit anything that would be material to an investment decision. So you can't have errors and you can't have omissions, either one, in the financial markets in general, but in the United States, that is particularly strong as a requirement. So selling the truth is something that I was predisposed to do, but I was working in an environment where it was the requirement. And then as I branched out beyond finance into technology, entrepreneurship, growing operating companies, learning the operating side of the business, et cetera, it became quite clear that you know there were different schools of thought. Some people were doing different versions of selling the truth. Other people were doing different versions of referring to themselves as sort of promoters. And then you had some people, you know, that were you know way out of bounds. So I think for me, observing, you know, the behavior of different people in more of the operating business side of my career made me even more committed the idea of selling the truth. And if if you have a moment, I'll just express it the way I've I've used it. In sales, there are different, you know, different types of sales, you know, different methodologies of selling. And uh, the one that I have always preferred is what I call the educational sale, which is where I basically take the approach of saying, look, here's what's going on. Here's what we're doing. Here's the plan, you know, et cetera, and laying it out. And then following that with, okay, is this appropriate for you? Is this suitable for you? Do you understand it? Do you have the risk profile that's matched up to what the risk is of the situation here? 
And if the answer is no, then it's mutually beneficial that, you know, we don't go forward. And if the answer is yes, then it's mutually beneficial that we do. But the educational sale is a style that presumes, let's make sure that you understand this first. Then we have the conversation about, do you want to buy this or do you want to invest in this or whatever? But, you know, suitability, fiduciary responsibility, all that comes into play in the final decision. But in my view, you can't make a decision about something that you don't understand. And that's where the educational sale is the way I try to both manage things, advise my clients to manage things. And that's the general framework. But so when I saw the selling the truth, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is good. I understand this. I'd like to talk to this person. Right. Yeah, thank you. Well, that's th- there are two sides of a very similar coin because of my background in advertising, your background in finance and tech. And where we're coming from is really the same thing, which is one of my podcasts is called Truth Tastes Funny, which is much more general and about you know, kind of swallowing that bitter pill of truth and using humor to help it go down. Right. But the principles are the same. We have to swallow that truth. We have to take that medicine before we can make a decision, before we can make an informed decision. And where I think you and I shake out is if we can serve the purpose of edifying the prospective, you know, client or colleague, if we can help them digest and process reality, then we're all going to be served in the end. And the end result isn't the sale, isn't the outcome that favors us. It's the end result. The goal is really that we've been a resource. We've been able to be a resource. Maybe we brought them an amazing deal. Maybe we brought them, you know, edification about something that they were about to make a mistake in, you know? But we've won, right? Because we've helped be a resource. And then the next step is mutually beneficial value. And then the next step is everybody should share in some way in the economics of that mutually beneficial value. But if you start out from the proposition that, you know, you want to use one of the words that you've used in some of your other conversations, if you want to create authentic value then yeah. that value can then be mute, become mutual, become shared, and everybody can do well. I think the thing that one of the things that's fascinated me in, in looking into some of the things that you've done is there seems to, to be many situations where the brand value that you were helping to create was on a very large scale. Yeah. You know, streaming channels in the millions and podcasts ranked in the top five and all, all sorts of just amazing scale. And the interesting, the fascinating thing for me is that the way my approach has evolved is that I was working for some very large firms in the early part of my career where the, the firm had the value, you know, 150 yeah. year old Wall Street law firm, top 25 in the world you know, Credit Suisse, one of the top investment banks in the world back then. And and so the organization brought the brand to the table. And then as my career evolved, it started to be a situation where some of the companies were were new and, and some of them got big and some of them didn't. But my whole approach started to be based very much on networking and referrals. So yeah. I think that over the years, I've built what I consider to be a personal brand. And the interesting thing from my perspective is, you know, how a personal brand interacts with some of the principles of growing a bigger brand. I mean, the most of the situations that I've been involved in have been situations where people said, oh, hey, George, can you do me a favor? You know, I might've been working on a huge project finance project for an airport that was, you know, rebuilding. And one of the people on the airport project said to me, hey, George, I'm working on this telecom company over here with one of my other projects. 
could you spend a few minutes with these guys on the topic of finance? A year later, you know, I was part of the founding group of what became one of the fastest growing fiber optic companies. But, you know, how do you get from Wall Street and finance and project management into fiber optic when it's brand new? And it was because of the referral, right? And the recommendation based on really the principles of, of how I approach things, looking at things from a multi-dimensional point of view and being able to relate finance to people that had no financial background. And so I'm always fascinated by, you know, trying to speak with people that are looking at things from a different point of view. And, you know, I've always approached the brand of what I was doing based on what I think you and I both would call, you know, personal branding through yeah. referrals and recommendations. But one of the things I'd be curious about is what is the role of the bigger brand idea for people in the world like me who have gotten where they've gotten based on personal brand? That's a really great, I appreciate all of that, George. Where it leads to is great because I always say that like, there's no such thing as as an impersonal brand. Every brand is personal. You know, even a big brand is personal at its core or it was personal before or it's personal to the, you know, it's the transactional, I don't know. There's a whole conversation that could be had about what transactional really means and what we've come to refer to it as, but the impersonal nature of a transaction. And I think what it means for you is that you're, personal brand is as powerful an entity, and I mean one's personal brand, is right. as powerful an entity entity as the biggest conglomerate in the world. You know, people pay a lot of attention to Apple and Nike and Disney and so forth and Amazon. But in reality, every one of those brands can be directly associated to a to an individual to a human being right. who had a vision or had an impact that carried through at this point, you know, in, so, in many cases, hundreds of years. You know, you look at brands like Birkenstock that are, you know, nearly 300 years old. There's something about it that is immovable and unchangeable. And yeah, there's a lot of agencies and all kinds of ad people and every, you know, we, I get it, you know, just do it was Dan Wyden. I understand that somebody came up with the words. That's what I do is come up with the words. But even me, my brand is that I come up with the words that are already in the DNA of my client or the brand or the personal brand that I'm working with. I think that as a personal brand, you're building something unshakable. And that is of tremendous value, especially in today's world. You know, we're grasping for stability and for verisimilitude and trust in a world that seems to constantly be pulling it out from under us. Yeah, it, I, yeah, I think, you know, I, I like to try to analyze situations through the lens of what I refer to as frameworks. Mm -hmm. um, and a framework to me is a repeatable path to success. And so one of the frameworks is how to manage with some degree of equilibrium. I call it a running lane of equilibrium that goes through a roller coaster of volatility. So from an image point of view, imagine sort of an up and down, up and down, up and down, and then draw a running lane through that. Not a single line, but a running lane. And if you can stay within that zone of equilibrium while, the, while your circumstances around you are in volatility... Right. That creates some degree of steadiness, right? right? Versus just, you know, going whichever way the wind blows. And and I think the the consistent question, you know, as, as I think about, you know, what stays constant is the two things that people want to know is number one, who are you? And number two, what do you do? And, you know, from my perspective, you know. The who are you is that sort of multi-dimensional 
analysis of situations based on multi multidimensional experience, expertise, skill sets, right? And then what do you do is bring the bring that multidimensional analysis to the evolving circumstances that exist, whether it's raising capital or whether it's helping to start an operating uh, company or whether it's doing a valuation or or sale of an asset, you know, whatever it might be, growing into a new market. And uh, so I think from our perspective, the brand needs to be able to answer consciously or subconsciously those two questions. Who are you and what do you do? Yeah. And I think that's where my success really has been grounded over the years because I've always been able to answer those two questions, either directly or indirectly. Yeah, very well said. So I think AI is really another one of these big technology shifts. But if you think about it, the iPhone brought in apps, right? That yeah. was not that many years ago. And then if you go back, if you want to go back further, you know, AOL back in 95 or whatever brought, you know, the internet to individual people, even though the internet as a technology has been around for a lot longer than that on sort of an industrial and research level. So these massively powerful technology arrivals do take a long time, maybe not a long time is the right, they take several stair steps to get integrated into the whole technology landscape. I think the most important thing about AI is that people are transparent. And here we go again with that truthful, sell the mm -hmm. truth. Yep. People need to be transparent and truthful about when they're using AI and how they're using AI. So I think if, if companies, if brands communicate to the recipient of the message, hey, in some way, and I don't know quite how to do it. I don't know if it's a footnote or, you know, some sort of a little notice thing on the bottom, you know, that, you know, this, this communication is a blend between AI and human. I think misrepresenting AI as human is then you're being guilty of the 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 deep fakes and the other things that people are view very negatively but if if you're able to be truthful and transparent about the hey this is an ai generated message at least at this point when people are not sure about you know where the good and the risky is and all that where so i think how we interact with AI is going to evolve over time. But right now, people are in a zone of uncertainty. And if they're in a zone of uncertainty, it's very reassuring if people are truthful and transparent about what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of interesting the way that came around like full circle, the selling the truth idea, but it's going to be, it is going to come down to that because, and it's also going to come down to, I believe, the interaction between people and and the AI, the tools, you know, the relationship, if you will, that we develop with these tools is going to be tantamount because that right now you can look at a commercial let's say or or some output or some document and not have any idea whether it's real or not there's when i i believe that when when someone knows that it's ai it's it immediately changes their the impact that that has on them. and the temptation will be for people to not disclose that they've used ai because in a way it's almost an integral part of the success that you actually don't know it until until later, right? Or Correct. that you never know. 
It's Correct. almost it's almost going to. And that's right now. It raises more questions than answers. We don't know about the the verifiability of the information. It's everything happens so fast now that, you know, it it almost undoes itself before it even. It right. Even and there's it. so much AI that's already being used. I think that's the other thing from an educational point of view. You know, AI is a concept term, right? Right. I mean, AI is already used in in search, for example, to pick out you know, what search results you're going to get. Uh -huh. um, and so it's already being used that way. But I think that if people want to really monetize the relationship of selling the truth, then they need to figure out a way to be truthful with their audience you know, I don't think you need to say, oh, this search result was generated with the use of AI because everybody kind of already knows that. But depending on what you're communicating, I think there, there is a role for basically saying, listen, you know, we're, we're doing this, you know, using AI and, you know, you're the brand expert, but there's a way to build brand trust in saying, oh, this brand is being more honest with me than others. And that can be a differentiator. I don't know. But my instinct around this stage of AI is that people know it's going to be helpful. People know it's also going to get manipulated and abused in certain ways. And so I think people are going to be more relaxed about AI in certain situations, but in situations where it matters, things relating to their money, uh, their privacy, things like that. I think it's going to be important to uh, somehow communicate to them that uh, they're dealing with a truthful vendor or truthful yeah. service provider in some way. And then the other thing is, it's going to be fascinating to see which companies try to go sort of all in on AI and which organizations have a opt out for the human, you know? Yeah. Like in so many of these automated response things, if you hit zero or pound sign or whatever, you can bounce out right. sometimes to a human. To an operator. Yeah. That's my favorite yeah. thing is to hit the zero. <laughs> yeah. And try to get to a person. Right? right. But so I think it's going to be interesting to see which organizations continue to invest in that, that human element of the relationship with their people. So, but I think that AI is, you know, to me, the, the real opportunity is to figure out how to, how to be ahead of the curve versus your competition on the, on the topic of trust from your employees, your clients, your vendors, whatever it might be. And the user experience is what creates outcomes. Yeah. And the outcome that someone's seeking to create might be to neutralize mental health and wellness concerns. It might be to reinforce a culture of compliance. It might be to reinforce a culture of customer service. It might be to educate the organization about what we're doing on the topic of AI. I mean, there's just so, yeah. it, it's an unlimited potential, but I think that it keeps coming back to the strategic management of the organization. And because if, if organizations are focusing on, on tasks without having a context or a foundation of strategy, then they're going to be fragmented in what they're doing. And it's going to be hit or miss. And it's going to be wasteful in resources because, you know, one of the things that I always caution people on when they say, oh, we're going to start a blog or whatever, be really careful about starting a content strategy. Yeah. Because a content strategy has to be maintained. And that's a lot of work. And if you 
if you're not going to really, you know, support it, you know, don't start it unless you've got the ability, you know, to support and sustain it. So, but, you know, one of the reasons I, why I wanted to chat with you was that, you know, I think your approach to brand as value creation is much bigger of an idea than just, you know, the traditional view of, you know, well, what does brand do? You know, oh, right. brand is part of PR and getting the word out and all that sort of thing. But, you know, I think there's an opportunity because people, you know, 95% of people have an idea of what is a brand. Mm -hmm. And even if it's more narrow than what you see the potential to be of what a brand can do, it gives you a starting point. You're not creating this brand new word they've never heard of and saying, oh, you should be putting resources toward, you know, Jupiter. Well, right. what is Jupiter? No, you should be putting resources toward a brand. And let me tell you why. Because, you know, modern brand, branding, at least the way I, Hirsch, are doing it, is value creation. Value creation through branding. Yeah. And, you know, that's really specific. And that's going to get people's attention. And they're going to say, well, tell me what you mean by that. Yeah. Well, I, I, I love that. I love that, George. I mean, look, you know, the, the, the previous part, that piece about the, about the kind of integrity of the internal communications and what you're, what you're saying within your company, the, the, the various means of branding within the brand, you know, the brand actually meaning something in terms of its spine versus it being a purely external, you know, how does it, how does it manifest itself in your organization? Some of these ideas. Correct. And one of the challenges that you could pose in a conversation is if, if someone's going to work with you, if a company organization is going to work with you, they have to buy into your, you know, selling the truth. Mm -hmm value system, right? Because that's honest and sustainable and successful. But how can you externally sell the truth if internally you don't have that spine or that foundation in place? Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to put the external branding on hold for six months while you work on the internal brand. But if you're going to review the brand in terms of what can it do for the organization externally, then it seems to me you should also be looking at what can you do for the brand internally in order to create consistency. Because one of the hallmarks of customer service is that if you talk to five people, you get the same answer all five times. Yeah. Right. And, you know, people can say, well, you know, I don't really know how to go about doing this. And then I would come back with a strategic framework that says, well, one of the hallmarks of strategic management since 2019 has been the evolution from shareholder management to, to stakeholder management, where shareholder management was at what, what is the purpose of the corporation to create a return for the shareholders. And that's what Milton yeah. Friedman said 50 years ago, and right. that was the way it was. And then in 2019, the business roundtable, right, led by CEOs who represented about 40% of the market cap of the publicly traded markets in the US, 144 of them put out a short resolution that said, first time in 50 years, we're updating the purpose of the corporation. And they said the purpose of the corporation is stakeholder, right? So it yeah. became stakeholder capitalism, and there's five stakeholders, customers, vendors, employees, community, and shareholders. So now shareholders are one of five instead of one of one. Right. So is it shareholder purpose or stakeholder purpose? 
But the latest flashpoint is all this stuff around ESG, right? The environmental social governance, right? Mm -hmm. And that there both both extremes try to politicize that. You know, one side says, well, ESG is, you know, going to be all about, you know, sort of, you know, radical environmentalism, the elimination of fossil fuel, you know, all this stuff. And the same on the social side. And then the other side says, well, see, ESG has been politic radicalized. So we need to have anti-ESG rules for pension funds and investment funds and things like that. And as usual, both groups are not correct because ESG is really a management framework that says, as you run your organization, consider these criteria. Mm -hmm. Some under the E, some under the S, some under the G. And a version of the Jamie Dimon conversation about stakeholders, ESG is really a more elaborate version of the stakeholders conversation. Yeah. It's like, make sure you have, but what, what is the stakeholder conversation? It's a multidimensional view. What is ESG and its checklists under each of the three? It's a multidimensional view, which is where I come back to why I'm very comfortable talking about these things in a non-political way. Right. Very comfortable teaching about these things and very comfortable about integrating these things into strategy because I have a multi-dimensional bias in that I, I proactively want to look at a situation from a multi-dimensional point of view and not say, oh, this is not just a legal thing. This is not just a financial thing. Like someone says, oh, we need to raise money. Yeah. Okay. Well, is that a financial conversation? Some percentage of it is, but what is the multidimensional conversation? Right. If you don't have a very good sustainable business strategy, then how do you communicate how do you even understand the risk factors if you're not thinking about your business from a multi or your organization from a multi-dimensional point of view? So, and yet we also don't want to get lost in the in the in the weeds, right? Yeah. That's why I keep coming back to I think that in many ways, my focus on organizational strat, you know the sort of strategic analysis of an organization leading to a strategic implementation plan or execution of an or for an organization is really where my business is centered now because that's where the clients need to be yeah and i think that you're having a really strong <clears throat> foothold in this brand conversation puts you in a strategic position. Brand is not execution until brand is first part of the strategic conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's different. Like if, if you said five, 10 years ago, is brand strategic or is brand execution? Some people would say it's strategic, but most people would say, oh, just help me drive revenue or help me drive more people to buy my stock or help me to, you know, make the regulators like me or whatever it might be. But now, you know, I would put brand in that strategic topics basket. But I don't think that a lot of organizations would put it there on their own if people like you and me don't sort of poke them and say, hey, I mean, they put capital structure in there in two seconds. Yeah. They put human resources into strategy in two seconds. They put technology into that strategic basket in two seconds. But 
one of the things that I was looking forward to after I looked at your website was, hey, I want to talk to this guy, Hirsch, because I think that you think about you're dealing with brand in a in a strategic way. Well, thank you, George. I mean, I've described what I do as brand strategy and creative, putting the emphasis on strategy, but always sensing that people aren't sure how to take that. You know, right, but I would change the, the words. I would say brand is one of the topics that must be in your basket of strategic mm -hmm. uh, thought. Yeah, in your art, in your strategic arsenal. Right. You know, because the not to nitpick, but the phrase you used, brand strategy, is centered on brand right and the way i said it brand is one of the components of an organization's strategic roadmap mm -hmm. puts the puts the strategy in the center yeah it's not brand in the center and brand execution brand strategy brand for everything brand 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 no it's strategy, strategy, strategy in the center. And one of the spokes on that hub and spoke is brand. Yes. Yeah, I love that. But so yeah. is HR and so is finance and so is technology. Yeah, and so is and so is message. You know, the voice, the voice encompasses all of these things. Ultimately, but the voice is also, I think the voice is the X is where the, where most people think of branding now, because the voice is what, what's on the outside, right? The voice is what people hear, but all of those spokes make up the core, the brand being, you know, maybe the spine, right? Or strategy could be the spine, but it, it, we don't have to over. Over, yeah, we don't have to overanalyze it. Overanalyze I mean, it, but I get, I, I love it. I love what you're saying about the importance of brand. Yeah, yeah. If you expand what the word brand means in 2020 to 2030 to 2040, you have to change what does brand mean? And mm -hmm. brand means your internal brand as well as your external brand and having those two things work hand in glove. Yeah. And I think most organizations would say, would associate brand with external. Yeah. Yeah. But I think in this COVID decade and post COVID era and now AI brand needs to be internal and external at the same time it doesn't yeah. mean that you do the same thing with your internal brand campaigns as you do with your external brand campaigns but if if you're a organization of any meaningful scale and you do not have an internal brand strategy then i think you're missing out on on part of what is required to be successful yeah that's a really powerful way of putting it if you've enjoyed this episode of brand voice runway please leave a five-star review and subscribe to the podcast the positive reinforcement keeps us going who am i kidding founders like us keep going regardless thanks so much for listening and make tomorrow greater than today